I'm Mitch Gillette. Uh, I'm an artist. I live here in South Philadelphia with my husband, Chris, and hey, and our dog, Rocket. Though I followed his work for years, I only met artist Mitch Gillette last summer. Born in 1956, Mitch has led a relentlessly creative life. In order to take in my entire output, one must look at paintings, drawings, performance, collaborations, installations, design, the web, a book, and music. At times it all seems scattered to me, but sometimes I can sense, and I have been told, there is a cohesive style that is pervasive. In a 1993 Philadelphia Inquirer art review, critic Edward Sozansky wrote, Mitchell Taylor Gillette possesses an unusually fertile imagination, which enables him to create allegories that are simultaneously trenchant and entertaining. They can be either historical or contemporary, as you prefer, because the signals are mixed. The characters are modified commedia dell'arte, but the visual language, and especially his high-voltage palette, is pure comic book. In terms of current art fashion, Gillette's fools defy characterization. They're an acquired taste, but one that's agreeable even if you can't identify all the ingredients. I would call that a rave review, but this is how Mitch recalls himself feeling just a few years later when he decided to quit painting. Always far afield of the trends, I believed what made my work different made it avant-garde, but I was deceiving myself. Stubbornly representational, my work can be obtuse, ridiculous, ironic, or rude. It flirts with bad taste or looks old-fashioned. It can be lurid, cartoon-like, comical, and puerile. It's intent on provocation in both style and content. The work often sets itself up for ridicule on purpose, but it is also deadly serious. That's the trip. And I was suddenly and devastatingly embarrassed by all of it. And I was on a fast track to a major emotional crisis. Mitch's friend Judith Schechter once told me that without suffering, there'd be no need for art. And I believe that making art can help relieve it. So before we delve into what brought Mitch to despair, I wanted to map out his artistic path. He grew up in Springfield, Vermont, and his parents, seeing his knack for drawing, enrolled him in art classes. At the Miller Art Center, classes with the painter Hazel Kitts Wires, and there I executed my first painting. But he learned from other sources as well. My great uncle Linwood lent me three how-to cartooning volumes. They emphasized anatomy and figure movement. Superman, Lois Lane, and their kin in DC Comics were my greatest influence. I was especially enthralled by the work of artists Kurt Swan and Kurt Schaffenberger. I copied their drawings endlessly. Their treatment of the figure has carried through all of my work. The influence of these comics made clear very early that I would be a narrative figure painter. Mitch was also interested in music and drama, but when it came time for college... 
In deference to my folks' concerns with my making a living, I left New England for the big city and the Philadelphia College of Art to study commercial illustration. Commercial art was a bad fit. Nevertheless, I received some valuable training from, among others, color theory with the master painter Martha Mayer Erlbacher. It was she who informed me that I was too painterly for illustration, and I saw immediately what she meant. Realism, or some form of it, was my goal, so I transferred to the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Art, the storied bastion of academic training, and on the next trip home, I revealed to my parents that as a fine artist, it would be unlikely I would make much money. Alas, Mitch was not only destined to become a fine artist, he would soon be an art school dropout, leaving the academy to paint on his own. And miraculously, he found a gallery. Studio Diabolique, an oasis of offbeat figurative art. Brothers Stephen and Robert Carb had an eye for the unusual, and we shared the same artistic inspirations. I hung a series of large black-and-white narrative drawings of mythological subjects and figures in symbolic settings, still some of my favorite work. It was the Carb brothers' plan for an art magazine that led me to the subject matter that would stubbornly occupy me for decades. They asked me if I would contribute a comic strip. I had become obsessed with the Ballet Russe and that remarkable group of artists, composers, and choreographers. I read everything on the subject I could find. I came upon a rare recording of a little-known Prokofiev score from 1921, The Tale of the Buffoon. It was adapted from a folk tale. The plot beggared belief. A buffoon preys upon the greedy and ignorant, repeatedly bilking 300 rubles out of everyone he meets. I identified with the dark ferocity of the comedy and the sharp observations. The magazine idea was shelved, but Tales of the Buffoon was produced by the Carb Brothers as a crude comic book and sold in the gallery. Soon, I was creating large-scale paintings based on the comic, and they became my first solo exhibition at the Cooperative Philadelphia Gallery Nexus in 1990. Still bewitched by the Ballet Russe, I became consumed with the idea of creating a collaborative dance piece based on Tales of the Buffoon, the comic book. Mitch connected with choreographer Anne-Marie Mulgrew and composer Claude White. The production was performed at the Painted Bright Art Center with six dancers, a recorded electronic score, and a live percussionist. Filmmaker Glenn Holston was in the audience. He was working on a series of filmed shorts for the Philadelphia Public Television Station, WHYY. Holston had seen the comic book and had the wonderful idea to marry the drawings with the performance piece. The resulting six-minute video featured the dancers performing in my black-and-white drawings. The series won a local Emmy and was broadcast nationally. Mulgrew, White, and I went on to create three more collaborative dance works. For one, I constructed elaborate Victorian bustle dresses with trains made entirely out of newspaper, which were destroyed during each performance and then recreated for the next. Mitch's second show at Nexus in 1992 was called Fools. That's the exhibition that earned the glowing review from Ed Suzanski. Mitch himself characterized his paintings as 
high-color oils depicting figures from an imagined folklore. Nude, seen through transparent and painted on garments, they sported false noses and balding heads, male and female alike. Beginning with this group of paintings, I became characterized as exploring gender roles in my work. None of it is purposeful, all of it is unconscious, though I do recognize it as a pervasive theme in all I do. For the Fool's exhibition, I mounted a one-night performance of Tableau Vivant using live, semi-naked, painted performers briefly glimpsed in scenes set within a mini proscenium I built. In 1994, at Studio Diabolique, Mitch exhibited a set of still lives with a twist. Ten oil paintings I called object studies, featured various objects held by a hand and arm, my own. I lovingly rendered the muscles and veins. Still lives hold no interest to me without the insertion of human parts. Despite his successes, Mitch began to have misgivings about his lack of academic training. I applied to the New York Academy of Art, a program of intense, rigorous study of anatomy that included work with cadavers. The dean and I sat down together and spreading out my portfolio, he told me more study was superfluous. It didn't feel that way and I couldn't recognize it. I was actually cheating, cobbling figures together like Frankenstein monsters from bits and pieces of classic anatomical drawings and vintage erotica. The result of the meeting with the dean caused a substantial disruption in my work and pushed me to lean more heavily on my imagination, abstracting the figure more rigorously. The result became my first solo exhibition at the Snyderman Gallery. I call the works Deconstruction. Ed Suzanski wrote another glowing review, but he seemed aware of a mood change. He wrote that all the figures are depicted in states of psychological, physical, or cognitive deprivation. Gillette's view of human society is only superficially comic. Essentially, it's rather bleak. One may be diverted by his superb technique, his spatial tricks, and his descriptive eccentricities, but the gravity of his message is always plain. The dichotomy between his quirky visual language and his message remains difficult to reconcile, but the images are the kind that stick in the memory. By any objective measure, Mitch's art career was succeeding wildly. I was receiving plenty of support. I was showing in a commercial gallery and I was regularly reviewed in the papers, but the support was overwhelmed by rapidly intensifying, crippling doubts. I was on the calendar for another solo show at the Snyderman Gallery and the date was swiftly approaching. I was panicking. I decided to resurrect an earlier practice of building my paintings over a black ground instead of a white one. But when it came time to deliver the canvases to the gallery, I discovered to my horror that several of them, created in semi-transparent layers of color over the black grounds, nearly disappeared when removed from under the spotlights in my studio. I had failed. I apologized for the work constantly at the opening reception. I hated all of my artwork. I stopped painting. Nowadays I refer to those as the dark paintings. Looking at them now, I am struck by their uncannily accurate representations of a descent into a deep depression.
this was a long time coming. And to understand it, we need to look back at Mitch's childhood, which at first glance seems idyllic. I grew up in Springfield, Vermont, with loving parents who loved one another, a strong and affectionate Italian mother, a daughter of immigrants, and a New England-bred English father who was sensitive to a fault. Dad was a machinist who raised beagles as a hobby, and Mom kept a spotless home and made all her own bread and pasta. The town was 10,000 people, and the Vermont setting was bucolic and picturesque. Mitch asked me to read the rest of the story, and as I do so, you will hear his piano composition, Poem, performed by Tom Lawton. From an extremely early age, I was the target of sexual abuse. I was bullied and indoctrinated by an older male. It continued in secrecy for many years. With the onset of maturity, I realized I was allowed to say no, and I was finally able to end it. I am queer, so confusion, shame, and fear were all compounded and affect me to this day. No one knew. I could not speak of it to my parents or other family members. Later, as an adult far away from home, I confided in my close circle of friends. The full impact of my childhood trauma would come to manifest itself with the onset of mental illness. I've been diagnosed with clinical depression, anxiety disorder, bipolar 2 disorder, and borderline personality disorder. In the throes of overwhelming emotions, I am unable to think straight or stay grounded. Deep in it, there seems no way out. It has torn friendships apart. Then, humiliated, I have arduously patched them back together again. My beleaguered partner has absorbed relentless abuse for years. Though not a cure-all, the combination of therapy and medication has helped Mitch as has the unwavering support of his circle of friends, and especially the abiding love that he shares with his husband, Chris. And Mitch's indomitable creative spirit soon reasserted itself. The illness tricked me into thinking I was idle for years, but in fact, I never stopped creating. First, I turned in another direction. I began to visually transform all aspects of my optometrist partner's West Philadelphia optical shop, Modern Eye, with themes of humorous surrealism. I began a tradition of absurdist art installations for window displays. The windows occasionally created public controversy and, I'm told, regularly drew the attention of the art department of the University of Pennsylvania Eventually, I would design a second shop in Center City, Philadelphia, from scratch. I would later discover I was creating branding for the stores when Professor Joseph Hancock used Modern Eye as an example for the introductory chapter to his book, Brand Story. I began to paint again, a series of larger-than-life nudes. Too self-conscious to confront live models, I once again used nude and semi-nude figures from vintage cheesecake, beefcake, and nudist magazines circa 1930 to 1960. Their demure classical poses suggested to me an interesting dialogue with the depiction of nudes in history. The paintings were all set seaside and poolside, bright and colorful, the antithesis of the dark paintings. I love these paintings 
but Mitch told me that at the time he had no intention of ever showing them. And then discovering a forgotten stack of index cards, which outlined a novel length version of Tales of the Buffoon, I fell into a 20 year undertaking, a graphic novel in nomenclature only. It is essentially a storybook for adults. Each page is an illustration in a horizontal children's book format, accompanied by a spare, ever so slightly cynical narration. I wrote the 324-odd page book first as a script, then storyboarded it, designed each page in pencil, scanned the drawings into a computer, and then with Photoshop, added line, hatching, color, shading, pattern, and lighting effects. The book tells of the wily ways of an enigmatic trickster couple, the buffoon and his wife, who, through chicanery and ridicule, repeatedly bamboozle and defraud the scheming seven other buffoons and wives, who fail consistently and miserably, are maimed or are repeatedly killed, sometimes by each other. Along with various other adversaries along the way, the buffoon and his wife finagle $300 from all, with a twist at the end of each tale. The duality of the trickster couple rang a loud and clear bell for me. They are mocked and dismissed, relegated to the bottom social status. The ultimate fools. They are constantly assumed to be easy marks. They are gods of misfortune. Mechanics of the comic curse of humanness. Although his creative powers were back, Mitch had not shown any work for more than a decade. That changed in 2014 when Rachel Zimmerman of In Liquid Gallery gave Mitch a show of 25 large-scale prints from his book. A great deal is made about artists and their need to create to satisfy an inner self. And that is partly true. But I have always thought of myself as an entertainer. My work is for the viewer. In the end, it faces outward. In 2019, he had a show at In Liquid of those nude paintings that he assumed would never leave his studio. And there is an upcoming public event which has its roots back in the 1980s, when Mitch dropped out of the Pennsylvania Academy and was sharing a house with a music student who owned a piano. With a limited musical background as a clarinetist in the Springfield, Vermont High School concert band, and no keyboard training or study of music theory, I found myself glued to the piano, working out my own classical pieces in a heady fever avoiding work at the easel altogether. Mitch told me he wasn't skillful enough on the piano to play some of the most complex passages that he was composing. So I was writing in my head, unable to play any of this. Even in short spurts, I couldn't do it. And then I just abandoned it. Though Mitch returned to the visual arts, his piano scores have been resurrected almost four decades after they were written. The music I shoved in a drawer has made an unexpected return, recorded by pianist Tom Lawton. Tom will perform Mitch's compositions at 7.30 on November 18th, 2023, at the Pennsylvania Academy. It's free but space is limited. So make a reservation. I have a final question for Mitch. Given all the aesthetic activities which you have pursued, how would you 
complete this sentence. I am a teller of stories. Okay, we're about to take a final look at some of your stories and their characters while listening to your composition, Humoresque. But first, I must have words with your husband. I cannot end this movie without thanking Dr. Kress for his incredible good advice about my chronic dry eye problem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And thanks for the eyelid scrubs. I'll try them tonight. All right. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs>